It was a frantic situation in front of Brian and Nicole Albert's home in Canton, Massachusetts on the morning of January 29, 2022. Police, emergency vehicles, first responders, and three civilian women were on the scene. On the front lawn of that home, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, partially buried in the snow, frozen and lifeless. It was the scene of a tragic death, and prosecutors say it was murder. One of the three women who had pulled up to the scene was Karen Reed. She was described as hysterical by witnesses. She was John O'Keefe's girlfriend. She attempted CPR before first responders arrived. She was physically and mentally shaken. Witnesses say she was repeating the phrase, I hit him, I hit him. A statement which seemed like a confession to striking Officer O'Keefe with her SUV. Prosecutors believe it is a confession and have charged Karen Reed with murder. Karen and Reed doesn't agree. In fact, she is claiming her innocence and says she dropped John off at a party inside that house and someone in that house murdered John and conspired with local and state police to frame her. Tonight, we will take a listen to witnesses who drove to the house that night. What did they see? What didn't they see? What does it prove? We'll bring in our insiders as we continue our investigation into the tragic death of Officer John O'Keefe. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Great to have you with us. Things are heating up inside the courtroom in Dedham, Massachusetts for the murder trial of Karen Reed. Let's, let's go back to the scene, the home of the Alberts. I mean, that night, there were a lot of visitors to that house. There were people inside the house there were people outside the house people being dropped off people being picked up people coming in people leaving there was a lot of traffic through there a lot of visitors so when you think about this case keep this in mind you've got all these people running around the house both sides here are saying there was a murder that night and that john o'keefe was killed purposely either by Karen Reed with her car or the defense is saying someone inside that house. But the bottom line is on either scenario where you're talking about the murder of a Boston police officer, there are people all over the house. I mean, a lot of witnesses that night. A lot of witnesses who saw things. You know, they, they, they saw the weather, they saw each other, they saw cars pulling up. They saw people walking in, people walking out. They heard conversations. They all were drinking. It's all been described as a very good time by everyone. But at the end of the day, in a case, again, where both sides are claiming that this Boston police officer, John O'Keefe, who everyone agrees, a tremendous guy, like a great guy, was murdered. And with all these people, right, in the house, outside the house, pulling up to the house, driving away from the house, no one apparently saw John O'Keefe. How does that work? How does that make sense? Again, let's review what we just went through. There are people inside the house there are people outside the house there are people pulling up to the house there are people driving away from the house all of this is going on and this officer is murdered yet no one saw him the closest we have to anyone seeing officer o'keefe is a reference to a black blob on the yard which they didn't think was a human being because if they did they wouldn't have just driven past uh, this black blob that they saw on the yard. This is amazing. So no, so no one sees him before the murder and no one sees him after the murder. How is that possible? How does that make sense? It, 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 it's hard, right? Now, you have to keep this all in context again, right? It's a trial. The defense doesn't have to prove anything. Prosecution has to carry their burden and prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Defense doesn't have to do anything. But 
you know, they're saying something else happened here, so they got to give us something, right? So what are, the, what are they giving us through the cross-examination? What, what is the prosecution giving us through the direct examination? Who can this jury trust? You got a lot of witnesses testifying about what they saw, and a lot of them testify about what they didn't see. And, and the common denominator in all of that is the victim in the case, John O'Keefe. More compelling testimony today inside that courtroom. Let me bring in Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson, joining us live from outside the courthouse in Dedham, Massachusetts. All right, it, you know, it can get a little confusing, uh, all these people, because it's very busy, a lot of potential witnesses in this case, and a lot of people are taking the stand. Let's start, talk about uh, uh, Julie Nagel's brother. And again, Julie Nagel is significant because she's the one who may have seen John O'Keefe. She says she saw a black blob on the front yard as she was driving away that night. Um, Julie Nagel's brother and two friends drove up to the house that night. Tell me more. Very nice to see you. So we're getting the group today of witnesses that were the rides for the people that were at the after party. And this included Ryan Nagel and his then girlfriend, Heather Maxson. They were in a car together. They were on their way to pick up Julie from that after party. And what she noticed and told investigators in this jury today is really key because she noticed a black SUV and also two people inside. Take a listen. As you're uh, yielding to this vehicle taking a right, uh, what, if any, observations did you make of, of people inside that other vehicle? I've noticed a male and a female in the car. And uh, where within the vehicle was <coughs> the male and female that you observed situated or seated in the car? The female was driving and the male was in the passenger seat. So when Ryan is then on the stand, he talks about also seeing that black SUV parked in front of the house, but he only sees one person inside. Listen to this. I observed that there was a, a person inside the car with uh, the interior light on. And that would be sort of a, a dome light, is that right? Correct, sir, yes. Can you see where the, where the dome light was as far as in the left, right, or center of the vehicle? Uh, I was in the center. It seemed like she was looking straight ahead with her hands at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. Now, as far as uh, the other, what, if anything else, did you see, or who, if anyone else, did you see with, uh, within the interior of the vehicle at that time? I only saw one person at the time. I didn't, I wasn't really looking. It just happened to be like at a glance as we drove by. Only saw one person when the SUV is spotted in front of the home, Vinny, and then they were pressed on what they saw and didn't see. They did not see John O'Keefe exit the vehicle or in the front yard. They also did not see, they also said they weren't looking for it, but damage to the SUV. Okay, so Heather, the former girlfriend of Ryan at this point, right, they're broken up. Um, she sees a male figure in the car, can't identify him as John O'Keefe, but that's at the intersection before they drive down the street. But once they dive, drive down the street, she doesn't see John O'Keefe. She doesn't see him exit the car, doesn't see him in the car. Yeah, that's correct. So they gave the right of way to the black SUV that they saw on the roadway. So that car makes it to the same house coincidentally before they do. And that's exactly what was uh, reported today in court. Okay. Things are getting clearer as to what people saw and when they saw it, but still not clear as to where John O'Keefe is once they pull up to the house. Let's talk about the first McCabe, I believe, to take the stand, Allison McCabe. Who is she and what did she have to say today? Yeah, she is the daughter of Jen and Matt McCabe, who we've heard so much about. And uh, she is the first McCabe to take the stand, Allison. Uh, she broke down on the stand at one point in time at the end of her testimony because she was really talking about Another factor in all of this, in this story that's unfolding in this community, what she claims is the harassment of her cousin Colin and also the harassment of her family. 
And uh, what, if anything, in relation to Colin Albert uh, being in the house has, has occurred as far as the harassment that you're talking about? Um, can you rephrase? Um, with reference to what you were talking about as far as the relevancy of Colin Albert being in the house at that time, um, what, if any, harassment was there in relation to that and in relation to Colin? Well, no, go ahead. She can answer. Colin wasn't at the house, so he's being harassed for... He was not at the house when John was there, so I drove him home. So he's, the people are harassing him, saying he was at the house when it's not true. When you speak about harassment, what, what specifically type of harassment are we talking um, about? Phone call, constant phone calls, emails, awful messages. As far as uh, you and, and your family, what, if any, type of harassment have you received? Um, people showing up at our house, um, people emailing my school, uh, um, uh, just like a lot of harassment. Can I have a moment, please? Sure. She had to take a moment, and rightly so. I mean, even the judge, I think, asked her if she needed a Kleenex. It could be felt here at the courthouse. But again, her testimony in uh, the case for the Commonwealth was really important and key because she introduces the text messages for the pickup time and after she was at the house, um, according to them. But she was challenged by the defense if she altered those messages at all before she screenshotted them and handed them over to investigator. You know, I, I looked at Allison McCabe, a lot of people were talking about her testimony, and I mean, she's a kid. Like, I, I can say that. You know, I know she might be 20 now, um, and she's in college, I get it, but this all happened while she was a high school, and she's still young. Like, she's young. To be put in the middle of all this, not an easy position, but such a significant witness for what the defense may be alleging in all of this because she is the, the the person who picks up Colin Albert and after her testimony we heard from Colin Albert today yeah he's a real star witness for the Commonwealth he took the stand today he was in that button-down shirt and he appeared very confident so Colin Albert is the son of Chris and Julie Albert who testified last week and remember those pictures that they testified to of taking in front of John O'Keefe's house on his lawn uh, straddling that fence there prank photos is what they called them so he was asked also about what has been alleged in this case if he had had any bad blood towards the victim, John O'Keefe. Take a listen. Did you yourself go anywhere else in the house? No. At any point in time in the evening while you were there, did you go upstairs or downstairs in the basement or out in the backyard or anywhere else besides the kitchen dining room area? No. About what time would it have been that you left? 12.10. And at any point in time that you were in that hall, uh, did you see Mr. O'Keefe inside the home? No. During the time that you lived on Meadows Ave or any, a couple months subsequent to that, um, is there ever any uh, animosity or any, any sort of uh, arguments or anything that you would ever have with Mr. O'Keefe? Never. Very tight-knit family. Now, when I saw him leave the courthouse here a couple hours ago, he left with his mom and dad. So they testified last week, and they were here, and they're going to be back here tomorrow when he's on cross. Um, Alan Jackson outside of the courthouse told us and other media that we can expect an intense cross because everything that he testified to is not necessarily true in their eyes. Yeah, this is going to be an important cross-examination of Colin Armour because they've seemingly really pointed the finger at Colin Albert, who was, again, in high school at the time. I mean, we have to keep this in, all in perspective. Not a grown man. Um, he was a high school senior, I believe, just like um, Allison uh, McCabe at the time this happened. They're a little bit older now. Um, yeah, that's big. That's, that's a big cross-examination tomorrow morning. Make sure you're watching, folks. In the meantime, I understand you also spoke with uh, the accused today, Karen Reed. Yeah, Karen Reed walking outside with her attorneys and all of the supporters greeting her and as she's making her way to her car. So I asked her the question on everybody's minds. We see how involved she is in her own defense when she's there at the defense table, always talking to her attorneys. So has she decided? Is she going to take the stand? Have you thought about testifying? 
I have. Are you going to give us a hint? I, if I had a clue, maybe I would give you a hint, but <laughs> wait and see how it goes, Matt. How's it been uh, being in the courtroom for the past couple weeks and everyone's close together, I'm sure? Uh, the intimacy is good. Uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and it's vindicating, Matt. It feels vindicating. The truth's got to come out. Thank it's you. the only way to do it. Every time that I've talked to her, she said that she is very confident and things are going well. Um, that's a good indicator right there of her mood at this point in time. But uh, she's in for several more weeks of the Commonwealth's case. I mean, we're just in the beginning of this trial, Vinny. We are. This is a long trial. This is a long, long trial. Matt Johnson in the middle of it all in Dedham, Massachusetts. Thank you, Matt. All right. So we've heard a lot of testimony from different witnesses coming and going and gets a little confusing, right? Who was there first, then who came afterwards? You know, when exactly do they um, say that this, this murder took place? Prosecutors, when could this have happened? So I wanna, based upon the testimony we've heard in the courtroom so far, I wanna put together a little bit of a timeline just to give us an idea of what's going on after midnight at the Alberts' home, according to the testimony here. And you can believe or not believe uh, the witnesses, but this is some of the evidence that has come into the case. Let's take a look. Um, and this happened today, right? 1210, that's what the text messages said. That's when Allison McCabe shows up uh, to pick up Ka Colin Albert. Uh, and at the same time, from prior testimony, it's around the time that Nicole and Brian Albert, the homeowners, are coming home from the waterfall. So as the adults are coming home from the waterfall, um, the, the younger people like Colin Albert, who was at the house um, celebrating, I guess, the birthday of Brian Jr., gets picked up by Allison because he says he's been drinking. They're friends. She agreed. She came to pick him up at 1210. Now, the defense is not going to agree to that, but that's what the testimony um, is. Now, let's move forward to 1230. Heather and Ryan coming to pick up Julie, uh, Ryan's sister, along with Ricky, who's the actually driving the car, um, leave at around 1230, right? They showed up to pick up Julie. Julie decides to stay. They don't want to go in. So Heather and Ryan and Ricky all leave. Heather and Ryan say as they leave, they see a woman alone in an SUV as they drive past it. That woman being Karen Reed in her black Lexus SUV. So at 1230, they're leaving. They don't see John O'Keefe inside the car. So where is John O'Keefe? I think the defense may say he's in the house already, but no one testified to seeing him ever outside of the car. So it's, it's confusing. Um, let's move forward. Uh, 1.30 a.m., we believe that the testimony is that Brian Higgins leaves that home. He, he, he stays till about 1.30, then he's gone from the after party. 1.45, um, this is when Jennifer McCabe and Matt McCabe are driving Julie Nagel, who stayed, and the, their friend and her friend Sarah Levinson. They leave in the McCabe's car at 1.45. That's when Julie says she sees that black blob on the front lawn which if you, you look at the timing there, it's around 1.45. So I guess they're saying that Karen Reed at some point between 12.30 and I guess 1.30 or whenever, somewhere in that window, committed this murder. That's, I think, what prosecutors are going to say here when they try to tie down the times here for the jury. But 1.45, that's when they leave. Now, between 1.45 and 2 a.m., that's when Tristan Morris shows up He's got to do some snow plowing that night, but he comes back to pick up his high maintenance, he, his words, not mine, girlfriend, Caitlin Albert, uh, picks her up between 1.45 and 2 a.m., and then they leave. And then we've also heard testimony uh, 22 minutes later, uh, those calls between Brian Albert and Brian Hagens going back and forth. Is it a double butt dial? Uh, you know, it's up to the jury to figure that out. Uh, but that's a little bit of the timeline. So I wanted to set that up for you because when we come back, we're going to break it down piece by piece with our um, Canton insiders who know everything about this case. Uh, we'll do that plus coming up in the next hour. We'll look at Chad and Lori's text messages. What do these communications reveal? The intensity of each encounter in my mind, one greater than the last. Oh my, fire emoji, fire emoji. 
especially this last one. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. It's a controversial case that's divided a community. Karen Reed is accused of murdering her police officer boyfriend. Prosecutors say she ran him over on purpose and left him to die in the cold. But Reed claims that she's being framed. It smells suspicious. After years of legal fireworks, will the truth finally be revealed? The end game is to figure out who killed John O'Keefe and hold these people responsible. The Killer or Cover-Up Murder Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, only on Court TV. Karen's driving, John's in the passenger seat, and they're on Cedar Crest Road approaching Fairview, where the after party is. And as they get to this intersection, there's another car approaching at the same time with Ryan Nagel in it. He flashes, so Karen goes first and makes the right on their way to the home where the party is. Now, the car that flashed its lights also going there, uh, Ryan Nagel, to pick up his sister. So Karen and John stop the car initially close to the driveway and Nagel is pulling up behind him. So Karen and John pull up a little bit further and stop just up in this area of the house. And then at that point, there's a conversation between Ryan and his sister. She decides not to go. And then Ryan passes John and Karen in their car and takes off. So that's the perspective when we, when we went to the neighborhood um, from Karen Reed as she's driving with John O'Keefe uh, to drop him off for that party. Now, that other car that flashed the lights at them, that's key today to some of the testimony that we heard. Inside that car, you have three people. Ryan Nagel is Julie's brother. Julie Nagel, the, the, the key witness inside the house, um, he's the front passenger. Heather, his former girlfriend, Heather Maxson, she's in the back seat of this F-150, but in the middle, right? So the back seat is it's in between the two uh, front seats, but it's in the it's in the back. And then Richard, uh, Rick, Richard, Ricky uh, D'Antuono, um, that's Ryan's best friend. They've grown up together. He's driving that F-150. Okay. So now I want to see. I want you to see the same thing that I just did, but from the perspective. Uh, from inside their car. They're, I'm in that white car, and that would be Karen and John O'Keefe. They stop, they flash the lights, and Karen Reed's car goes. The question is, how quickly thereafter does um, Ricky, Ryan, and Heather, do they drive and do they follow up behind Karen? Um, are they right behind her? Uh, do they wait a, a moment? Is there time for John O'Keefe to get out of the car before they even pull up? I'm not sure. But they pull up behind Karen to a certain extent, and then Karen pulls up a little bit further. There's mixed testimony um, about how many times Karen pulls up, different witnesses seeing different things. Uh, but then eventually they pull away and go past the car. And when they drive past the car, um, it varies uh, about what they see because the driver is just looking at the road. Okay, so let's take a listen now to the testimony of Ryan Nagel. Again, Julie's brother, front passenger seat. Uh, describe everything that he saw and heard as he pulled up to the home. When you stop um, in front of the driveway, about how far away from you is the black SUV that you saw? Probably a car or a car length in front of me, a car length and a half in front of me. And as you're sitting behind that, um, What, if anything, was in between the truck, Ricky's truck, and the, the black SUV in front? Uh, there was nothing, sir. And at any point in time uh, that you were there in front of the house, did you observe anybody get out of that truck? I mean, get out of the SUV? Uh, no, sir, I did not. And when you arrived there, what, if any, communication do you have with Julie inside the house uh, in reference to your presence? Uh, I texted her when we were coming down uh, Cedar Crest saying, hey, I'm almost here, you know, get ready to come out. And about how long was it between the time that Ricky parks in front of the driveway and the time that your sister comes out? Probably about two minutes. I opened the door just because I assumed she was going to jump in the back seat. And she goes, oh, would you guys like to come inside? Uh, I looked over at Ricky, and he goes, eh, maybe we should call it a night. Because obviously we were out for a long time. So she goes, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay a little longer. And so she shut the door, and I watched her go in the house, and that was it. As far as the black SUV in front of you, um, what, if anything, did you observe about uh, 
moving in that vehicle at any point? I noticed that the brake lights, the only reason I know this noticed is because the brake lights were on uh, and it moved, let's say moved up maybe another car length in front of us from where it was. And when was that in relation to when you were parked out there waiting for Julie, talking to Julie, when did that occur? Uh, probably simultaneously when she came out the door. Uh, so moved up a little bit further, about a car, car and a half? Uh, further away from us. Uh, facing in the same direction? Yes, sir. As far as uh, around the vehicle, uh, at any point in time, did you observe anybody exit the vehicle or be outside of the vehicle or anything like that? Uh, no, sir. No, I did not. And did you see anybody go from the vehicle to the house? No, sir. After you turned from Cedar Crest on the ferry, that vehicle was in front of you the entire time? Oh, yes, there. sir. Yes, yes. And so you watch your sister Julie go back up to the house, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Wait to make sure she got inside okay? Yes. And did you observe her go inside the house? I did, yes. And uh, after she gets inside the house, what, if anything, did Ricky do with the truck? Uh, he pulled out to go around uh, the SUV in front of us and then to go home. Okay, one thing that's super clear uh, from Ryan Nagel's testimony is when his sister Julie comes out, Karen's SUV is in front of him and is there the whole time and is still there when Julie leaves. So when Julie comes out and she leaves, that car, Karen's SUV, is still in front of him. Now, I want to go back. So you listen to what Julie Nagel said about that same moment when she comes out to speak with her brother. When you came out to the truck at the end of the driveway, what, if any, other vehicles did you see in the area of, of the house on Fifth? Um, well, before when I went outside, I did notice another vehicle before my brother pulled up. So you had gone outside before your brother had, or, or Ricky had fully sort of parked the truck? No, he was like fully outside already, and then I went out, and it was just Ricky's truck. Okay. And so at some point later, there was another vehicle that came up? Um, prior. The vehicle that you were talking about, um, where is that in relation to the pickup truck that Ricky's got? Um, well, it was like the, the SUV wasn't there when my brother was there. It was like before. Like when I was inside, I noticed it. Yeah. And so at the time that you were talking to your brother in the pickup truck, was the SUV still there? I don't believe so, no. And so where was that SUV parked in relation to where the truck was? Um, so when I noticed looking out the window, I did notice the SUV um, in front of the mailbox um, and then pulled up a little bit in front of the yard and then stopped and then pulled up again towards the flagpole. Okay, so this is important because this is right around the time of this alleged murder, right? She says she comes out, the SUV's not there anymore. Her brother said it never left. What does that mean? Let me bring in my guests. Joining me, Karen Reed supporter and expert, Nick Rocco. Criminal defense attorney, Joseph Krauske Jr., who at one time represented Colin Albert. And the YouTuber behind Yellow Cottage Tales, Kevin Lenahan, is with us. All right, so it's a, it's a conflict in the testimony here between brother and sister about that moment when she comes out. She says the SUV's not there. He says the SUV was there the whole time. Um, Nick Rocco, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? It means they're lying. I mean, everyone's story is completely different. Uh, Julie Nagel wants to say that Karen Reed wasn't there. Ryan Nagel, like I've been saying, is good. Like in his uh, interview, Karen Reed was the only one in that vehicle when they drove by. Now, one thing that matches up slightly to Julie Nagel is when uh, the driver, Rich, had said um, he didn't see Karen's vehicle until he got to 34 Fairview Road, which would somewhat make sense because Julie Nagel said she saw the SUV outside before her brother even got there. So that might be the only slightest bit of truth that Karen Reed got to 34 Fairview a few seconds before, um, you know, Ryan Nagel and the crew pulled up to the house. But, but the fact that, you know, she says the vehicle's not there, that can't be true because Ryan Nagel and Heather both said they drove by the vehicle and, and John wasn't in the car. So now she's lying about that now, now, do you believe that the jury is gonna is gonna believe her blob theory on the lawn? Absolutely not. Kevin Lenahan, what does this mean to you? The the conflict between the brother and the sister's testimony about whether or not Karen Reed's SUV was there when Julie came out? Because this is right around the time of the murder, so every minute is crucial. 
I'd like to borrow a Judge Canoni sigh. I don't actually think that that testimony from Julie Nagel was clear, and I blame the prosecutor for not making it clear. I don't think that's actually what she means. And if you look at the broader, even in that little bit there, she says prior to coming out, she was just a little confused about from the questioning, the way it was being asked. I believe. Are you saying Lally is not asking clear questions? Is that what you're? Is that what you're implicating here? Yes, and I don't think it's the first time that it's happened. And and uh, but I think when you look at the totality of her testimony, she did see two vehicles. She said, in fact, she said she saw one from the window when it, when they first arrived. She saw the dark, the black SUV there. So, and I think the important part, I wanted to help you guys tighten up your timeline just a little bit too. Sure. So, um, two witnesses in the car verify that they've arrived at the same time as John and Karen. John and Karen, according to GPS, arrived at 1224. Okay, so let's say Julie came out and spent a few minutes talking at the window. John last moved, according, or John's phone last moved at 1232. So sometime in between 1224 and 1232, that's when the truck that Ryan Nagel was in drove away. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> no, it does, absolutely. All right, uh, Joseph Krasky Jr., what does this do to the case? You're trying to prove a murder on a lawn. The jury wants a, a clear picture of what's going on here. And one of your key witnesses, her testimony, to me, right, seemingly conflicts. Now, Kevin's been studying this stuff for like years, right? As he knows everything inside out every minute. But I'm, I'm almost, I'm a little more educated than the jury. But it, it, to me, it, it doesn't make that much sense if she says, no, the, the car wasn't there when I came out. Not many, really. I don't know how much any of this matters. This entire trial is a paradigm shift for me in the way trials are conducted. Uh, certainly, look, recall is never perfect. It's typically uh, imprecise. Witnesses might contradict themselves and witnesses might contradict each other. And that's certainly fodder for cross-examination. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, though, it's still a net zero because Julie Nagel still has herself going inside the house without John O'Keefe in there. Sarah Levinson, the nurse, is inside the house and says John O'Keefe never comes in. There is a discrepancy, and the defense did a nice job of exploiting it. It shows me that the witnesses certainly weren't rehearsed or coached because there certainly was a glaring inconsistency. And look, I like Adam Lally, and he's a smart guy and a good prosecutor, but sometimes I feel like if you lit his ass on fire, he'd just sit there and say, ouch. So, you know, shame on them for today. Okay, let's take a listen now to more of Heather, uh, uh, Heather's testimony. Again, this is the former girlfriend of Ryan Nagel. She's in the back seat. What does she see? What doesn't she see when they pull away? As you go past the SUV, what, if anything, did you observe within the SUV? I observed the female in the driver's seat. And... Uh, appear to be the same female that you observed as you were turning onto the road of, of Julie's friend's house? Correct. As far as the male passenger that you saw uh, as you were pulling onto the street, could you see him at that point? I did not see any other, any other person, just the female in the driver's seat. Okay. Kevin, I'll start with you on this one. No one sees John O'Keefe inside the car when they're leaving, um, yet no one testified to seeing him get out of the car. Where is John O'Keefe? It's frustrating, isn't it? But also we, we should point out that Ryan Nagel is a good brother who watched his sister come out of the car, even identified what door she left out of. He, she walks down the driveway. Now, this would have been the time if Karen was telling the truth that John was dropped off into the driveway. And then after her spending a couple of minutes at the car, he watches her walk all the way back and into the house like a good brother to make sure she's safe. And she never sees John in that driveway, never sees him. It's, neither she or the brother see uh, John walking in the driveway or walking on the street. Nick, where's John O'Keefe? He's in the house. Julie Nagel stated that she was watching out the window. So so when, she, when John got dropped off at the mailbox, Julie's testimony was that she wasn't outside yet because she watched Karen's vehicle from the window drive forward, you know, three times is what she said. So she wasn't outside, so they wouldn't have crossed paths at that moment. So John O'Keefe got out of the vehicle, walked inside the house. All of these people are family. So if people think, oh, why would this person lie for this person? They're all family. I mean, Julie Nagel calls Nicole Albert Coco, and, he, and she calls Jen McCabe JJ. 
that's Rev. That's very close family family friends. I mean, it's 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 pretty obvious what's going on. All right, all the guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Colin Albert testified today. Where was he? When did he leave? When did Colin Albert go home? We'll talk about it when we come back. Did you yourself go anywhere else in the house? No. At any point in time in the evening while you were there, did you go upstairs or downstairs in the basement or out in the backyard or anywhere else besides the kitchen dining room area? No. About what time would it have been that you left? 12.10. And at any point in time that you were in that home, uh, did you see Mr. O'Keefe inside the home? No. During the time that you lived on Meadows Ave or any, a couple months subsequent to that, um, was there ever any uh, animosity or any, any sort of uh, arguments or anything that you would ever had with Mr. O'Keefe? Never. All right, that's Colin Albert. We've heard his name from the defense a lot during the course of this case, and now he testifies at the trial. Um, left at 12.10 is what he says. Um, who picked him up? Well, it was Allison McCabe. Take a listen. What did Colin say at 11.30? Um, you can get me now if easier. And what did you respond? Okay, I am driving people home now. And uh, what did Colin respond to that, and what time did he respond to he responded, word, get me after. And this morning, you could scroll down this bit. And um, following the get me after, what if any response did you provide? KK, okay, and here. And here that you texted, what time was that read on the screenshot? 12.10 a.m. Okay, so what does this mean if Colin Albert is leaving the house at 12.10? Let's bring back in our guests, Nick Rocco, Joseph Krasky Jr., Kevin Lennon. Joseph, you represented him at one point. You don't represent him anymore. Um, so is it as simple as, hey, he texts um, Allison, Allison picks him up, and he goes home? So I did represent him. I don't represent him anymore. Uh, and if you notice, he didn't have a lawyer there representing him, a 20-year-old man who handled himself quite well today, the same young man that went to the federal grand jury and did not assert the fifth. I think it is that simple. Uh, the defense is really leaning in on an individualized third party culprit of Colin Albert. I think they're doing that at their own peril and Hollywood's promised us a lot tomorrow. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the text is there. You would have to believe that Colin Albert turned over a screenshot of a text it is. that he had natively manufactured and put himself at risk handing that over to federal authorities and local and state authorities. Uh, Allie McCabe, for her part, was very clear and concise, and it corroborated and lined up with Colin Albert's testimony. At the end, she was cross-examined on the location 360. I don't know why Lally didn't object to that. There are so many inherent frailties with Location 360, especially when it has the Wi-Fi warning message. That means turn on Wi-Fi for more accuracy. That should have been objected to. Massachusetts has very strong decisional authority uh, limiting the use of GPS, GPS speeds uh, in Location 360 data. So I think Colin did very, very well. I think he put to rest the claim that there was some acrimony or problems before between the two of them and we'll have to wait and see but as a lawyer i feel almost everyone has a fifth uh and i certainly would have told him to assert the fifth if i thought he had one when i represented him didn't assert the fifth of the feds didn't assert it today uh nick rocco not only the testimony but they had the screenshots of these text messages well before i point out colin's fake text message Ali McCabe's text message between the time of 1155 and 1210 on a normal cell phone, it would show January 29th, 2022, and then it would show the text message of, uh, you know, the, the thing, whatever she said at 1210. That, so the date would have came first, and then the next te text message would be there. Now, as far as Colin Albert's text message, Joe, I think you missed this one. After the date of January 28th, 2022 what do you see next to that date there's a comma there there's no commas 
in anyone's cell phone, if you pull up your cell phone right now, you will not see a comma after the date, and that is going to destroy these text messages. These are these are manufactured, and not only that, the state is okay with taking a screenshot as evidence, but they want to def uh, you know say that the Cellbrite data that shows the 227 Google search didn't happen. Why didn't they pull the cell phone records and show these text messages? Because it didn't happen that way, and they're gonna, it's going to all get debunked tomorrow. That comma, that comma is going to hurt them. Kevin, how are you seeing this issue? Go ahead, Joseph. Joseph wants to respond quickly. You know, I've dealt with cell phones in hundreds of cases. I don't see the significance of a period of, or a comma. Why, if you were manufacturing, the argument from the defense today was all they did was go in and manipulate the timestamp. I see you laughing, but I, I don't see the significance. I have a little more experience it's, it's in this. It's crazy. Thing. Go ahead, it's, Kevin. It's I'll give you the crazy. last word. We only have about 25 seconds. And just looking at this lifetime 360 data, according to Yanetti, she took a 1223, a seven mile trip, a 1231, a 12 mile trip, a 1232, another 12 mile trip. This is this stuff is impossible. They're just manufacturing stuff, throwing spaghetti at the wall. And now Nick's got them adding commas where this is just this is cruel. All right. Tomorrow, tomorrow's cross examination. Big day tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, Nick Rocco, Joseph Kraske Jr., Kevin Lenahan. We're out of time for tonight.